And we should be live. Let me wait until I can see that you are indeed there. Welcome again, Emma, Tish, Sarah, Pisas, Anne, and everyone that I've missed. Welcome to Stoke Newington. Where did I miss her gun? Oh, you're in the hospital. Oh, sorry to hear that. <coughs> <coughs> Hope you're better soon. So welcome everyone. We've got about 10 minutes before to start. So if any of you were watching this on replay in the next few days or weeks, feel free to skip the next 11 minutes and, um, and uh, maybe even more, let me see. 12 minutes to be precise. And uh, we should be ready to go. Welcome, Herbie. Let me flip this camera and see the beautiful weather. So we're just waiting for everyone to connect. I'm here in Clissold Park and welcome Cynthia. So we've got about 10 minutes before to start. As, I, as you can probably see, it's not the most exciting weather today. Well, it was earlier this morning, but it's no longer the most exciting weather right now. When are you meant to be out, Emma? Is it, is it soon or, or do we not know yet? Oh, after dinner tomorrow. Steak pie, <laughs> nice. Good, so at least you don't have to stay there too long. <laughs> and welcome, Joanne. Nice seeing you here. So we've got about 10 minutes before to start. So if anyone was completely new, you've just clicked on this video and replay, you can skip the next 10 minutes. It's only us saying hello and getting to know each other. So today we'll have a little walk in Clissold Park. We'll try to go and see the animals, but I think they'll be hiding away with this weather. Then we'll go down Church Street and we'll go to the beautiful Abney Park Cemetery. The atmosphere is probably going to be quite eerie with this uh, grey weather. And then I've got a little murder mystery for you. Well, mystery. I don't think it's a mystery. Personally, I think it's a major of justice. But, um, but I'll tell you all that towards the end of the tour. Yeah, everyone is sick today. Hope you all get better. Got a little friend. Hello. He just wants. He wanted to be a YouTube sensation. He was looking at me like, "Put the camera on me, please." So I had to do so. Oh, you do a storm. Okay, so I shouldn't complain with my rain because at least it's not windy. So it's always a little bit easier with the umbrella when it's not too windy. And welcome, Ronnie Lynn. Nice to have you here. And we have nine minutes to go. I'm just staying here under her tree. I don't think it helps much, but well, it is a little bit drier according to the floor. We can see. So it's a good tree. I'm already wet anyway, because I've been here for hours walking my route and um, maybe not hours. Oh yeah, actually hours. So yeah, but it's just that you, you don't want to get the gimbal too wet. No the phone. Oh, you think your roof is going to blow off? 
Well, I'm glad it's not windy, you know, because um, Abney Park Cemetery, it is also a, a nature reserve. So they keep the, the broken trees, the, the, the wood that might be um, unsafe. Um, in another park, they would cut off the branches that are not stable and stuff. But because it is a nature reserve, they, they leave it there. So if it was too windy, they'll, um, they'll close it. And welcome, Wendy. Nice to have you here. And welcome anyone else that I've missed. Let's see if I've missed anyone else. Hi, Julie. Oh, you had snow. Wow. Yeah, it should be spring here soon, but not today. And Letarji is here. Welcome, Letarji. And Janice. Nice to see you here, Janice. So we've got about, let me see, seven minutes to go. What did I do? Oh, you were reading in the garden this morning, yeah. Well, this morning was beautiful here as well. Sunny and cold now, but very wet. Who's Daisy? Oh, Daisy, the dog. <laughs> Who's on my T-shirt? It is um, Alice in the Wonderland. Well, a punky, hipsterish version of her. I can't really show you more because it's... Uh, but yeah, there she is. <laughs> 40 miles away and yeah. And a similar weather. Yeah, I'm about... I'm about... Um, probably eight miles away from here, so it was uh, the weather was not gonna look very good at home. So I actually googled Stoke Newington weather, hoping it'll be any better than in South London. No, it was exactly the same. So I think at least it's raining all across, uh, all across uh, the capital. <laughs> yes, she's having Jack Daniel. That's from that's from the Camden Market. I think that's why they don't let you um, film in the Camden Market, or they don't like it, because I think they don't have the copyright from Jack Daniels nor Disney. So uh, so that's probably why they don't want you to film their products. I should take you back to Camden. It's been it's been ages. Oh yes, please do. Yeah, do DM me if uh, that could be interesting. Oh, is it raining in South London? Well, good. At least, at least there was nothing I could do. <laughs> I couldn't have gone earlier elsewhere. Let me check what time it is. And three minutes to go. Apologies, you've got a big, a big close-up on my face. But it's because I want the camera to be, uh, to be in the dry. With the video, that'll be better. And nice to have you here, Debra. Bonjour. And welcome back. And 
you're dry up there in Leicestershire. That's not fair. <coughs> so we've got three minutes to go. Oh, and I got a coffee from Mike. Thank you, Mike. A man full of dirty tricks. Mm. Oh, I think a lot of those murderers are full of dirty tricks. But what it is, what it is. Although sometimes it's a good story, but if, um, you know, when the area has changed too much or if, they, if there's nothing to see next to the location, sometimes, uh, um, sometimes for those virtual tours, the, the, the good story is not enough. I need something visual as well. Well, let's see, that could be exciting. What's Melonback? Did someone go to Melonback? Says Herbie. Emma, I don't know what's Melonback. <laughs> okay, let's go and face the rain already. I was just uh, standing here for the, for the shelter. But let's start with a view anyway. I swear this park is absolutely lovely when it's dry. Oh, okay. Right. And let's see what time it is. Oops, what did I do again? It's difficult to manage everything with the umbrella and I think it's time to start. So welcome everyone. Welcome to Stoke Newington. We are in North London. We are about um, eight miles from, uh, from Charing Cross. Um, if anyone was completely new to me, you're very welcome. I'm Natalie and without further ado, let's go. Let me flip this around. So we are in Clissold Park. It's, um, it's an amazing park, uh, open to the public, and uh, the building you see straight ahead is known as Clissold House. Well, it is now, but back in the day when it was built, it was known as Paradise House. So we're very lucky in London, we have a lot of parks, and uh, it's a very, very green city for our capital. And we do take them for granted, but some of them were not always uh, public, and definitely not always free, open for all. Um, this one here used to be private land. The gentleman that built the, the home, uh, pa Paradise House, his name was um, Jonathan Hall. I didn't say any naughty word, Hall. H-O-H-O-A-R-E, Jonathan Hall, not, um, not W. And he, um, he, was, he was an, abolition, an abolitionist. Um, Stoke Newington really is... Uh, was a village of visionaries. Today it's very much part of London, but back in the day it was a little bit on the outskirts, a little bit up north, and um, you had a lot of uh, Quakers, abolitionists, um, nonconformists. So very um, modern uh, ideas were being um, uh, uh, brought up here, really. And Jonathan Ho, he had, uh, he was a banker. You might know the, it's it's the second oldest bank in the UK. They're they're still today based on the Fleet Street, and he um, he actually had trouble with money towards the end of his life, and he sold the land to another gentleman. That guy had a daughter called Elizabeth, and she had. Um, well, she fell in love with the priest from the church next door, St. Mary's Church. 
um, her dad was completely against it. You know, it was like the, the Romeo and Juliet of their days. Um, quite romantic, actually, because they, they used to pass little notes over the gates and everything. And eventually they did, uh, they did get married. And uh, um, the, the, the land ended up in the possession of, uh, of her nephew. And then eventually he sold it to the church commissioner. And uh, in the uh, in the late uh, in the late uh, uh, 19th century, unfortunately, it was going to be sold for development. Um, you might know London grew quite rapidly in Victorian times. Um, I mean, we've got Victorian homes everywhere. You should see this area on the map before. Before Victorian times, there was hardly anything here apart from Church Street, and uh, and now it's very very much um, built up. And um, there's a gentleman known as Joseph Beck. You may have heard his name because he was, um, I think, his family invented uh, the the uh, microscope. Oh, he had the deers the hiding in the shelter. Look, I don't think they'll come any closer today. Let me try to get the focus. Yes. So that's uh, that's our little fallow deers here. They're all hiding in their little shelter. That's cute. They often, usually the deers, you often see them um, uh, sat and they look like they're chilling. It's actually because they're um, they've got a four uh, chamber stomach, a bit like the cows. So they have to um, they have to uh, they have to digest a lot. They chew, then they, uh, they swallow, then they chew again, um, and they kind of cuff the, the food back and they chew again. So they digest, uh, they digest a lot. Oh, it looks like we're gonna be able to go closer to this one. Let's go and see him. Pretty church, yeah, we're, going, uh, we're going to the church in a moment, Laurie. You'll see it a bit closer. So yeah, the, uh, uh, Joseph Beck, he, uh, he created uh, the Clissold Park um, uh, Committee. Clissold, by the way, that was the priest, Augustus Clissold, uh, the priest that was uh, in love with Eliza. And uh, yes, let's go closer to him. We'll, uh, we, we can say hello. And um, yeah, he spent uh, 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 years trying to preserve the park and trying to buy it off, um, convincing the, the local authorities to, uh, to, to put money towards the project. Hello, my love, we're coming to say hello. I have carrots if you want. Let me try it. It's not easy with the umbrella. Let me, yeah. Would you like my carrot? <laughs> I, don't, I wish I had another hand or two because it's not easy to grab the carrot with the... Hello. Would you like a carrot? Let's see if you want my carrot. Hey. I've got, I've got my carrot here, but I don't know. Hey, mate. Look, I've, I've got a carrot. So cute, it's a baby as well. I actually bought the carrots for the goats, but I think he should like a carrot as well. Do you want a carrot? No. They are actually almost, almost blind by um, human standards. They see the movement more than anything else. So I don't know if you can see my carrot. Oh well, I'll eat the carrot myself then, my love. At least I've shown it on camera, so at the end of the tax year I can put the carrots down as an expenses, because obviously it was for the tours. My accountant, she's probably having a laugh at the end of the tax year. I, uh, you know, I'm doing a tour in Notting Hill uh, in a couple of weeks, so I'm going to have to watch a few movies. Would you believe um, um, Notting Hill is £2.40, so that's okay. Um, love actually is £5.99. So I'm going to have to put it in my expenses at the end of the year. So, you know, you have some weird expenses when you are a YouTuber. So my accountant is probably going to be like, why is she buying carrots? And she's watching Love Actually for work. But yeah, welcome to my life. <laughs> anyway, um, let's, uh, let's exit the park. Let's go on Church Street. The, we had goats there, but uh, I didn't try the goats because they were hiding earlier. Anyway, so yeah, um, Joseph Beck managed. So he managed to get some money from the different uh, local authorities here. We are actually at the border of two, uh, two boroughs, 
still today, but you might know at the time London had many more boroughs. Um, does my library offer movies online? I don't think so, Tish. They, have, they still have some old DVDs, but I don't think... Uh, I know they have a few audibles now. I've not, tr I've not tried yet. I need to go and see them, see how it works. But movies, I don't think so. Well, in the United States, you have Love Actually on Netflix, but not in the UK, not anymore. They've removed it. I don't really have to see it, but, you know, for me to tell you, that was there, that was filmed there. I need to know the, the story. Anyway, so yeah, that's how the park was saved. And it was opened um, eventually in, um, in 1989. It's, um, it's amazing to see, you know, the, the, the massive amount of effort that was, uh, that was done to preserve it and to have it open for the public. And now we, I mean, if we knew how much time and money they, they spent trying to save it for us, we'll probably be a bit more grateful. Let me show you the new river. So this, well, today it's technically a pond because it's no longer a river, but this is the new river. So that was dug at the time of uh, James I. It was meant to supply um, Angel. So you've got big uh, reservoirs just above the park there. And the new river went all the way till, uh, till Angel. Right. It comes and go in the US. Yeah, Mike, you're right. I think, I think uh, although it's hard, to, I've got an old computer that still reads DVD, but it's hard to, to have a, uh, anywhere to read a DVD, DVD nowadays. But yeah, it's probably, I probably should look actually, you're right, a little bit cheaper than streaming. And I've got about three weeks, so I can actually buy it, you're right. Anyway, let me show you. So we were talking about the, those um, boundary markers. There's our oh, boundaries. I'm going to have to squeeze in behind those guys to show you an old boundary marker that's hidden right here. And um, so see those little, uh, those little blocks here? They're actually 19th century boundary markers. So at the time we were at the border between um, South Horsney, Stoke Newington, that was a borough at the time, and um, Islington. All right, let's go. Today we are still at the border between Highbury and Islington and Hackney. Because some of you might know, we have, um, in 1965, um, the, uh, you know, London used to be 86 different authorities which were pretty much the, uh, the, uh, the, the parish, uh, the, the, the church's uh, parishes. And in 1965, they went down to 32. So it was a massive puzzle they had to, to make. They had to match boroughs together to, to make it only one. And they didn't want to keep the same names. Um, so in theory, you shouldn't be doing Highbury and Islington, uh, Kensington and Chelsea. They were meant to come up with new names like East Ham and West Ham became Newham and um, Stoke Newington is no longer a borough today. It is, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it is part of Acne. So this beautiful church, it is St. Mary. It's actually quite rare, but we have two St. Marys right next to one another. The architect for this one is George Gilbert Scott, not to be confused with Giles Gilbert Scott, it was his uh, grandfather. He was known for a uh, uh, Gothic revival. He's done the, uh, the Albert uh, Memorial um, in Hyde Park. And he's done the famous uh, St. Pancras uh, station. Um, and, um, and of course, he's, uh, all his families, they were all architects, so it's a bit confusing. His sons were architects as well. And his grandson, he famously designed the red telephone boxes as well as Battersea Power Station, uh, the Tate Museum. When they first did this one, they ran out of money. So the, the top wasn't there for many, many years. It finished as a square. And let's go and take a look at St. Mary's old church, which is the only surviving Elizabethan church in London. Hi, Michelle. And Linda is here as well. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to rainy London. 
So the, um, the, the old church, it's known as the old church, but it's the old St. Mary's church. It is now an art venue and uh, 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 they do theater, they do poetry night and stuff like that. But it does feel like, uh, it does feel like stepping back in time, you know, in a little village when today we're very much, uh, very much uh, part of London. There we go. And let's go around because I want to show you a couple of amazing graves. One of them is an abolitionist, James Stephen. He was, um, he actually helped uh, draft the uh, uh, Abolition Act, but he also, he did great work because he worked as a lawyer in the, um, in, uh, in, in the Caribbean. And um, he managed to, so, you know, we had already abolished slavery, but on, on British soil here in, in Britain, um, it still happened in the Caribbean. There he is, James Stephen. And um, he managed to, to convince people that being anti-slavery was actually being patriotic. He wrote uh, The Crisis of the Sugar Colonies in 1802, um, basically explaining that we should stop selling some free manpower to, to our rivals, the French. Um, so yeah, he did, he did great work on it, partially thanks to him and a lot of other, a lot of other uh, abolitionists, that finally we got rid of that horrible trade. Well done. There we go. So let me show you my favorite grave in here. It's actually the perfect weather to show it to you because it looks even scarier on a day like this. There we go. I don't know who she is, but she's got a little story, a little personal story at, at least. Um, when I started being a tour guide, I, um, uh, I, used, I didn't have enough work in the winter, so I used to do agency work. And I spent a few, uh, a few days in here promoting the leisure center. Um, so I'd be working a few hours with a colleague that I would never see again or that I had never seen before. And I was uh, approaching people in the park for work when this young guy was like, hey, you're a tour guide. So the guy I was working with, he was like, you're a tour guide, come, I'll show you something, you'd love it. So he took me to that grave and he told me that his granddad told him that that was the grave of a witch and uh, that she had been buried here, but the very, the very spot of the ground had been unconsecrated because she was a witch. And that's it. I never spoke to him again. And, uh, and when I started, uh, you know, researching for, for a tour here, I was like, I need to find the witch. Um, I didn't, but um, one of my uh, followers, you might remember him, Richard, he did a bit of research and he actually found that it could be a Mary Webb. She died in 1756. So, Accusing, of, um, accusing anyone of, of witchcraft was no longer uh, a thing. Uh, they had an act in um, 1735, um, so basically uh, there was no more witch hunt at the time. But, you know, in people's, uh, uh, people's uh, culture, you know, they were still scared of the witches. And that Mary Webb was the wife of the, the innkeeper, the pub straight down the street, the Three Crowns. And there is a history of innkeepers being accused of witchcraft. Um, very often they were accused of poisoning their customers and, and stuff like that. So it is possible. She might, have had, uh, she might have had the reputation of being a witch. But again, we don't know that for sure. That's just what uh, Richard found into the burial records. Anyway, this is the old uh, Stoke Newington uh, town hall. As we mentioned earlier, uh, Stoke Newington is no longer a borough, so there's no need for a town hall anymore. A lot of the former town halls, they have been um, uh, converted into venues for hire, which is the case here, or um, uh, art centers like Battersea Art Center or Finsbury Art Center. And uh, this, uh, this beautiful building, you can still hire it. So technically, you, can, you could still get married here uh, if you hire it. For Back before, uh, before it was built. Uh oh, I've lost you for a sec. Let me see if it's coming back. Oh yeah, you're back. 
And on, so there was a little, uh, a little row of Victorian house, houses called um, Church Row, and um, uh, what is what's his name? The, the coroner at the Jack the Ripper inquiry, Wine Baxter, uh, he lived there apparently through the through the time of uh, of the Ripper story. Hold on, I need to cough. <coughs> Sorry. There we go. So we are now on Church Street. Well, it is technically called Church, um, Stoke Newington Church Street, because, you know, in... Um, oh, my phone is all wet. In, uh, 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 eventually, uh, after the Second World War, you know, they realized they had, they had too many church streets and high streets. Uh, it was very complicated for the post office, so it was renamed Stoke Newington Church Street instead of just uh, Church Street. You had a cheese ad, <laughs> interesting. And um, this little street is uh, it's amazing because there are very, very few chains. It is mainly um, small independent businesses. So it's one of the streets in the UK with the least, um, uh, the least amount of chains. There is a Nando's, there is a Whole Foods, there's a Foxton, uh, but I think that's about it really. So that's quite nice too come and do your shopping here and support um, local businesses, really. It's very quiet today, of course, because of the rain, but um, it's also quite a, a hipsterish um, area. And uh, you had some bacteria drinks ad. Well, it's good. You At least you all have very personalized ad. But it's funny because I think you had an ad when the app was telling me transmission issue so maybe sometimes I think my signal has dropped when actually it's when you, you guys are watching an ad. Anyway, while we're here, amazing fun, not fun box, letterbox, VR, Victoria Regina. So the, the letterbox is at least 130 years old. That's quite cool. And that's a former little muse here. So those would have been stables back in the day. No ad for euros. What did you do to deserve no ad? <laughs> Interesting. That would be nice if they put it all uh, at the same time, but no. Thank you, YouTube. <laughs> anyway, let's go a bit further to take a look at the Banksy. You can probably already see it straight ahead. See the black hole? Would you believe there's a Banksy there? It is... Um, Probably not of his best one, uh, one of his, his, his older pieces from the 90s. It is meant to, to represent the royal family at the balcony. And um, it had been there for many years. And apparently the council tried to contact the landlady to ask her to remove it. Because Hackney, at the time, um, they had a strict policy on, on graffiti. So does uh, Westminster, you know. Westminster has also removed the Banksy because they said if you if you leave it there it's like condoning graffiti which to be fair I, not that i agree but who decides you know it's not fair who decide what brings value to the, the the town and what doesn't what is art and what is not you know um so anyway the landlady never replied she actually didn't receive those letters from the council because they had the wrong address and one day People came up and the, the, the council was in the process of painting it. Let me show you what it looked like before. I think I have a photo. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what the council did. And then they, they run to the, to the council worker to stop them. So they have, uh, they have removed part of the art and we've saved, uh, we've saved the middle. And the piece might look a little bit familiar because it has been used um, to, uh, to inspire Blur for their cover. You might remember the album, so they used uh, they used this as as, um, as an inspiration. Oh my God, my phone is all wet. I just hope my gimbal will survive because it's new. Anyway, let's go further down. <coughs> so, ah. <laughs> so we have a beautiful pub straight ahead. This is the Red Lion. Well. I said the Red Lion, one of the Red Lions. We have over 600 pubs um, known as the Red Lion in the UK. It's quite a good name for a pub because the, um, 
Well, you might know the, the uh, before the Reformation, a lot of the old taverns and pubs, they had some very, very Catholic names, like the Saint Stephen or the Saint Peter's or whatever. And when, uh, when the king broke up with the, with the Catholic Church, a lot of the pubs rebranded to please the king. So they might have been, uh, they might have been called the Ark, suddenly they'll be called the Ship, or they might have been the St. Peter's and they might go with the, the Red Lion instead. And that was also quite convenient because you might know a lot of the pubs, they have an illustration of the name. So, um, so people that couldn't read, they'll be able to spot the, the, the illustration. So the Red Lion is of course quite easy to, um, to, uh, uh, to illustrate. And let me show you a little hidden gem here. Well, first, if you come down from your horse with dirty, dirty boots, you have one of those uh, uh, boot scrapper here. Convenient on a day like this. I should come back after the, after the graveyard with my dirty shoes. Well, technically, they're already dirty because I've already been there. But let me show you the parish lockup. You might know before the creation of the Metropolitan Police in 1829, we had those parish um, watchmen that were there to, to check for crime. And this is where you'd be locked up for the night before you'd be put to the magistrate the next morning. Then whoever caught you probably would get a bit of money from, uh, uh, from government for catching you. So not the best system. Now it's probably a very expensive flat. I don't know how much, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a trendy area today, um, especially here towards uh, Church Street. And that pub, they used to, uh, people are waving, they used to do comedy gigs uh, inside. I did, a, I, I did a couple of comedy nights myself in here. Once in the toilet of the pub, I, um, I found a wallet in the cubicle, in the ladies, the wallet contained 120 quid in cash and, uh, and two credit cards. And I had this little moment, you know, like in the cartoons, when you have a, a little angel you and a little devil you that, that speak in your head, you know, the little angel was like, bring it to the bar, bring it to the bar. My little devil was like, should I just take one or two notes? Just a little, a little commission. And the little angel was like, no, no, karma's gonna get you. And then the little, um, the little devil was like, if you don't do it, the bar staff, the bar staff is gonna do it. Um, anyway, it took me a, a few seconds of reflection, then I gave it to the bar. And the, um, the, the barman actually said, oh no, she's just left. So if I didn't think, if I didn't listen to my little devil for a minute, I might have been able to catch the, la the lady before she left. But hey ho, hopefully she came back for her, for her wallet. The Shilaile there, it's meant to be a very good uh, Irish pub. One of the best ones outside of Ireland. But uh, all the Irish pubs, they always say they're the best one outside of Ireland. What happened, said Janice, what happened to what? To the, to the wallet? Well, I gave it to the bar staff, I don't know. Hopefully the lady came back, but I don't know. While we're here, see, I'm not gonna cross over because it's hard to read, but um, see, uh, there's a little plaque straight ahead uh, on the building between the Condan uh, windows. Um, they, uh, um, that's for uh, Daniel Dufault, the writer of um, uh, Robinson uh, Crusoe. He was also, uh, he was also um, uh, 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 some kind of a Quaker, or at least uh, criticizing the religious system. Um, like many people around here in Stoke Newington. Joseph Beck was one of them as well. That's why he wanted to preserve the park, Joseph Beck, because those people were very um, uh, modern in terms of, of, of uh, thinking about mental health and, and, and well-being. They were really visionaries, you know. Um, and anyway, Daniel Dufault, he actually criticized the, the church. So they put him in... Um, I don't even know how you call them. You know the thing, it, it, it's, it's a punishment. It looks like a guillotine. It's not a guillotine, but you put your head in something, you, you harm in something, and people are meant to throw um, rotten tomatoes at, at you or, or whatever it is as a punishment. But Daniel, um, Daniel Dufault, uh, they loved him, so they didn't, they didn't throw any rocks at him or anything. Apparently, they gave him flowers. 
karma always bites you in the bum. Yes, lethargy. That's why I've been a good girl. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's go into the beautiful Abde Park. Oh, you know what? No, let's not go straight uh, into the into into Abne. Let me show you a little piece of street art just here on the road. You might have seen um, you might have seen some art from the same artist when we went to uh, where did we go? Um, oh, by the canal in uh, in Angel, uh, but it was a bit dark, so you probably didn't see it. Well, there's another one here. It's called Brick Flats. So whenever the guy spots a brick missing into a wall, he's gonna create a tiny little flat with um, some kind of resins or, or, or plastic. I'm not sure what he's using, but it's super cute. Let me show you. So that's, uh, that's what he does. So whenever he sees a, a missing brick, he creates, he takes the dimensions and he creates those amazing little flats and, um, and he fits them into, uh, into position. You know, whenever, whatever wha one might say about uh, street art, uh, I mean, some pieces are amazing, you know, and I definitely don't think they should be removed. Um, like this one in particular, it's, uh, it's just so cute, you know. Anyway, let's go into Abne. So Abne Park Cemetery has been through a massive refurbishment for the last two and a half years. That's why I couldn't do this tour anymore because it was, um, see this is new, the ramp for, for uh, people on a wheelchair. Before that you had to go up some, of, some stairs here. And um, apart from the ramp, I have to say I actually preferred it before. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's go. So Abne, Abne Park is, um, is one of the Magnificent Seven. So that's one of those amazing Victorian cemeteries. Um, and it is um, uh, the first fully non-denominational. So that's for people that did not really conform to the, to the Church of England in the states in which it was at the time. So they had uh, um, the, the, the ground was not uh, consecrated by the, by the Church of England. And one of the most famous residents, well, they have quite a few. We have quite a few people from the Salvation Army here. You can see from the shape of their graves. Um, but the most famous is, of course, William Booth. So the Salvation Army, um, I know a lot of people might not really know much about it. It's, although it's all over the globe, um, if you are in America, you probably know the Salvation Army because they come ringing the bells in front of Walmart at, at Christmas. Um, it is a church, but it is, it is an amazing association. Um, William Booth was, of course, into... Uh, you, it's an evangelical association, but it was also sh social work at the time. Um, so whether you are religious or not, they did... Um, William and his wife, Catherine, they did an amazing work. You'd have to remember that in Victorian times, society was extremely unfair. And the area of, of Whitechapel, where he preached, was horrible for some. You'd have a lot of people with very strong problems with alcohol. And sometimes their kids had no shoes and the parents were completely drunk on gin. And it was extreme, extreme poverty. And uh, uh, his approach was to preach on the streets which had not been done before, you know, but he, he believed there was no need to preach to people that were already at church. He wanted to preach to people that were struggling on the streets. And he actually created uh, training programs for, for the kids to learn a trade. Or, um, his wife, Catherine, was very much um, uh, uh, trying to raise the age of consent for a, a little girl, because as you might know, there were some ridiculously young prostitutes. The age of consent at the time was 12 years old. And um, what is, uh, apologies, it's horrible, but um, in Victorian times there was, um, well, we might have spoken about syphilis before in some of my tours, 15 to 20% of the population was um, contaminated by syphilis. And there was a weird, um, you know, fake news remedy. Some people said at the time that if you had sex with a virgin, you'd be cured by syphilis. 
So you can imagine what happened to some very young girls. Um, yeah, not only were they abused, but they would also be contaminated. So horrible, horrible times. And Catherine was really, really fighting against that. And wh when they created the, the Salvation Army, they purposely took the vocabulary of the army, the, the vocabulary of the war, because they were at war against sin. And still today, they still help in many, many countries. They help with uh, um, disaster, uh, you know, if you have a hurricane or anything like that. They help with uh, addiction, well, anti-addiction programs. So it's still a very, very important um, organization today. And William, he, uh, he used to walk all the way down to, to Whitechapel to go preaching on the streets and he'll be, he'll be beaten up. People didn't want him at first, you know. Um, he actually had to hire um, an Irish boxer to, to protect him on, the, on his uh, preaching uh, adventures. So very, very um, important people and they deserve to be, to be remembered. You love the personality of the cemeteries, yes. The, um, the, uh, the atmosphere is a little bit scarier when it's raining because there's literally no one here. Um, well, quite a few squirrels, they were earlier, but I think they're probably hiding away from the rain now. Anyway, let me show you a lion, the Bostock lion. Frank Bostock was also known as the lion... Oh, I've stepped in a big puddle. Um, he was also known as the Lion King, and uh, he was um, he was uh, buried here with his wife Susanna. Let me show you. I've got a photo of Frank. I think yes, that's a portrait of Frank with his lions. So he was um, he was into what they called the traveling menagerie at the time. So he was um, doing uh, uh, interesting shows. Let's say. I think today we'd look at it differently because our um, empathy towards uh, animal welfare has changed quite a lot since uh, Victorian times. But um, he, uh, he trained a lot of lions, not only lions, uh, um, chimpanzee, kangaroo. He also created um, kangaroo boxing. Um, you might have seen some of those videos. I mean, personally, I don't think it's okay. But um, yeah, he's created those uh, those shows with humans um, fighting kangaroos. It's, uh, well, I suppose in a way it's quite funny to watch because the kangaroo always wins, but yeah. And um, he, uh, when he died, it was a massive, uh, a massive uh, uh, ceremony. They had done a life-size um, lion with flowers uh, and a kangaroo as well. See, you can see they have removed some um, headstones because the refurbishment is not completely done. So you can see this is waiting here to be, um, to be removed. So um, personally, I think it was better before. It was, it's a bit more organized now. But anyway, let's go and see the chapel. The chapel has been completely redone. Now it's going to be a venue for um, kids at some kind of uh, uh, nature workshops or, or whatever it might be. It's going to be a venue for uh, welcoming people. Hold on, it's very, uh, very wet here. I'm going to try not to fall. There we go. So that's the chapel. So the chapel, it's been a chapel for funerals only. And it is also non-denominational. So you could come here and have a funeral for any, any religion you'd like. And it might look a little bit familiar because it is here that they filmed uh, Back to Black with um, the, the, the video clip for Amy Winehouse. Let me show you. I've got a few images. Let me show you Amy here. Uh, can I do three at the same time? No, I don't think I can. Oh, let me see. There we go. So that's, um, you know, uh, well, I don't have a... I don't have any reason, but, you know, uh, we only say goodbye with words. I died a thousand times. So that was filmed uh, right here. She probably didn't live too far. She was from a Jewish family in North London. So we're right underneath um, Stamford Hill, which is a big, uh, a big uh, uh, Jewish area. Anyway, let me remove the photos. Sorry, I'm a bit slow because everything is harder with one hand only. Uh, Move, photo, move. There we go. 
and um, let me show you. So this is the monument for all the, uh, the, the people that lost their life in the First and Second World War. The catacombs were underneath, I think, but they've been, uh, they've been locked in. And behind that, we'll see a beautiful uh, statue of uh, a chap called Isaac Watt. <coughs> Isaac is not, uh, he's not buried here. He's, um, he's, uh... thank you, Linda. Yeah, if you, if you like what you see, it's always nice to have a little thumbs up on the, on the video. It helps the, uh, the algorithms. Um, Isaac was, uh, he, he was also a nonconformist. But today we don't realize because today, you know, at the time church was everywhere. And um, if you were an unconformist, if you did not want to be officially uh, swearing oath on, on, with the Church of England, then you wouldn't be able to be educated at, at Oxford or at Cambridge. So you had to be educated here in a um, uh, nonconformist non, non uh, uh, little academy here. So there is Isaac Watt. He's literally the guy that inspired the, the cemetery. He used to live here in a home called Abney Home with uh, Lady Abney, Mary Abney, for 36 years. And, um, and uh, uh, then she decided to, to, to give the land for the, for the cemetery. He's actually buried in, uh, in Burnhill Yard, uh, Burnhill Cemetery, in the uh, graveyard, Burnhill Graveyard it's called, in uh, Old Street, which is also for nonconformist. Anyway, I wanted to show you this grave here because uh, there's an interesting story behind it. Thank you, Rose. Thanks, thanks everyone that uh, that did that. And um, it's the rose, of, the, the the rose, the, the grave of William Frederick Tyler. He was a police constable here in uh, well in Tottenham around here. And um, there's also a young um, a young boy that is buried next to him. One of those graves, he was buried at the same time. A boy of 10 years old, so that's quite, uh, that's quite sad. He was um, Ralph Jocelyn. Um, they were both killed the very same day. They were killed in, um, in what they called the Tottenham Outrage. Oh, sorry, I'll tell you a bit more. And um, yeah, the cemetery, by the way, I, I always kind of look around me because it... Um, how can I put it uh, politically correct? Um, it's also, or it was at least before the refurb, uh, a pickup a pick point. So if you were into, um, into uh, uh, having, se having sex in the wild, uh, some people were doing that here. So if people come to you and they're like, oh, do you have the time or anything? Do, uh, do be careful. They could be up to something. Because it is, a, it is a nature reserve. You might be able to hear the, uh, the birds around me. Um, you have in the, in the park about, um, well, I think it's 800 and something invertebrate. Um, over 400 species of plant. Mary Abney, actually, she created a, how is it called, an abrorarium or something with a lot of trees when she, uh, when she did the park. You have over 300 um, species of fungi. And uh, breeding bird, at least 25. They used to have an owl, a single owl that would cry looking for a lady. And also eight species of mammals. So foxes, bats, wood mice, squirrels. Um, so yeah, it's quite, uh, quite an amazing place for nature. Oh, sorry, my umbrella is... Oops. Anyway, the Tottenham Outrage. So I didn't tell you what happened. So uh, 1909... In Tottenham, so it's not far from here. If you uh, if you took a left here at the at the end of the cemetery, you go up uh, 15 minutes. You are in Tottenham. Uh, 1909, we're starting to have some motorbikes and some uh, some 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 vehicles, but you mainly still on horseback. Um, Arboretum. Thank you, Mike. I know it sounded a bit Latin, but yeah. And um, he. Uh, uh, so we have a few vehicles, but it's still mainly trams, horseback, and um, there's, a, there's a gentleman that was going into a factory that was a factory where they did the rubber. So they were producing rubber for tires for the new motor, automobiles, you know. And um, they had a lot of employees, about and, uh, on, on 150, I think. And on Saturdays, that was payday. 
So the, the guy had to go to the bank to get the equivalent in today's money, we're talking about £10,000 to pay all the employees for the week. And uh, when they got in front of the factory, which is literally right next to um, to Tottenham police station, they were stopped by two guys with a gun. They 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 pointed their guns towards uh, towards the two uh, the two staff member with the the money bag, and they fired. The, uh, the it took half a second for for the gentleman to open his eye and realize he, he was not hurt, but the money bag was gone. And of course, when they heard the gunshot, all the police officers came out of the station on horseback, on bicycles, on foot, and the chase started. Now, it's, it's actually a very terrible event because four people died. Well, the police officer, the boy, plus the, the, the two robbers. But it's, when you describe it, it probably sounds a little bit comical because he, they were uh, somewhere on foot, somewhere ho were on horseback. Everyone got involved. A lot of the local people started to chase them as well. There was a lady that was throwing potatoes at the robbers. And then they eventually, so the robber got into a tram. They, they, they pushed the driver away. They, they pointed their guns towards the ticket inspector. So he had to drive a tram. He never did that. So the police officers ran into the next tram. So it was a chase on trams. Then they, uh, they got on foot. Then they got on bicycles. So they took every single, um, every single uh, 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 vehicle possible. And that was like six miles. And you had everyone running after them. So you have the two rubber, but uh, a lot of police officers and a lot of people from the general public that wanted to help. Um, sadly, the, 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 the robbers were firing a lot of um, gunshots. And one of them hit a little boy that was uh, delivering bread. So that's the boy that was buried next to the officer. And finally, PC William Tyler um, faced the robbers and he was like, game's up, you're done. And the robber actually shot him. Um, Though I said robbers, they were not only robbers, they were actually part of the, um, they were Latvian revolutionary. Uh, there were a few revol revolutionary groups in Europe at the time. They were, it was not really an act of terrorism, but they were trying to raise money to, to print some flyers and stuff for the revol re revolutionary movement. Um, and uh, they, uh, eventually they ended up in Wattenstrow, where they got into a home and uh, both of the robbers actually um, actually killed themselves. They were buried in uh, unconsec unconsecrated secret graves in Walthamstow. Um, the money bag was never ever recovered and the police officer had a grand funeral here at the, at the cemetery. Uh, 3,000 police constables came to, to support him with the boy as well. The boy was buried on the same day next to the police officer. So that's uh, uh, an interesting story. It is the Tottenham outrage, if you, um, if you wanted to look it up. Oh, you know what? As much as I hate the rain, it's looking beautiful on camera with the reflection from the, um, from the, the traffic lights and everything. It's, uh, what was the year Janice is asking? 1909, 1909. So that was in Tottenham, straight up there, that's Tottenham. That's where I used to cycle every day when I, through the, after lockdowns, when we didn't have any international tourism, I worked as a tour guide on top of the Tottenham uh, Stadium, the Spurs. Anyway, before we go, I have a little murder story for you. It's, uh, it's a very sad story, but it's also uh, an interesting one. There was... Can you hear me well despite the noise or should I wait until we turn? Because it's a very noisy road. Um, let me know if the sound is no good. I can also, uh, I can also wait a minute. Sounds like a Benny Hill comedy. Well, it does. Um, yeah, 1909, Ronnie, yeah. Yeah, the reflection on the streets are amazing. <coughs> Just, uh, I'm just gonna wait until it's a little bit quieter to tell you the story because those cars are really. Uh... By the way, we're going towards uh, Stamford Hill, Stamford Hill. So it's a very uh, Jewish area. It's um, a lot of uh, um, um, ultra orthodox uh, people living around here. So you might see people with their interesting hats and uh, and um, 
and uh, well, it, when when it's raining, they always have a, a little plastic above the hat to protect the, the beautiful hats. But anyway, so yeah, you might see uh, uh, those hats coming up soon. All right, now I'm gonna take a left, and it should be much better in terms of traffic. So the murder, it is the case of Louisa Massé. Louisa was a, a, a French lady, well, half French, half British. She was very pretty, 35 years old. We'll go and see where she lived. She, well, she spent, she was educated here, but she also spent a lot of time in Paris. And in Paris, she had a, um, an illegitimate boy. Well, she fell pregnant in Paris, but I think he was born here because it was so scandalous. In, uh, in, in, in Parisian society. She moved here. It was very scandalous here as well. You know, at the time when you had, uh, when you had a child out of wedlock, your reputation was tarnished forever. All your prospect of career, of, of marriage might just go away from you. And uh, uh, you love the sound of the rain. Oh, that's good to know, Michel. And um, so she, uh, she moved here into her sister's home. Her sister was called Leonie and she lived here on Betton Road. And she, she did accept Louisa to come and not pay her rent. So she was not in trouble with money. She didn't have to pay her rent and she was working. She was teaching French on piano. So she had a, a decent income. And uh, when the boy was three weeks old, she decided to put him in the care of a nanny. In, uh, in Tottenham and uh, uh, so the, the lady would take the boy full-time and act as a nurse um, she was paying her the equivalent of 60, 60 pounds a month and um, the nanny grew very fond of the little boy um, his name was Manfred and um, his mother loved him too his mother was coming to visit him every Wednesday afternoon um, According to what the nanny had to say, the mother loved him very much. She didn't keep, her with, with, keep him with her because um, the family was not really impressed. And let me cross. Oh, no, there's a letterbox, I think. Let's stay on this side. Um, the, uh, the, the, the family was, uh, uh, yeah, they were not happy with the idea of having an, illeg an illeg illegitimate boy. So they, they preferred the boy living away. But, um, the mummy was coming to visit him. The nanny was great. The boy loved the nanny on his mum. Um, Louisa started to have um, an affair with a very young man. I'm a bit stuck here, hold on. Thank you. So she started to have an affair with a very young boy. The boy was a lodger next door. So her mother lived next door and she used to take a lodger. His name was Odor. That's a cool name. Um, a French uh, gentleman, Odor Luca. And um, Odor was 19 years old when, when Louisa is 35. So again, that's a little bit unusual for the time. And um, apparently she did tell Odor about her illegitimate son. So it wasn't a problem for him. Um, and uh, uh, one day, out of nowhere, the nanny received a letter saying, oh, I'm so wet. Mm, just a bit worried for my gimbal, it's completely wet. The, um, the nanny received a letter that the boy was, uh, uh, was going to go to France. Her dad in France wanted the boy to have a, an education. He wanted the boy to be able to speak French. So apparently she was going to remove the boy from her care and send him to France. The nanny, of course, was gutted, but, you know, nothing she could do. So they agreed to meet at, uh, at Stamford Hill in front of a pub so, that, so the nanny would give the boy back to, uh, to Louisa. The nanny was going to miss the boy very much, so she had a photo taken of him. Let me show you. This is Manfred here. Um, so, so that was taken the day of his death. And... Uh, uh, so she, um, she handed the boy back to her mum with um, a package with some items of clothing from the boy and his favourite toys. And here, here they went, the two of them jumped on a bus. I say a bus, it, it wasn't really a bus at the time, you know, there were those um, 
they were dragged behind horses on some tracks, like um, uh, omnibuses, but behind uh, behind buses, behind buses, behind horses. I meant. And while we hear another letterbox that's quite old, this is George V. You might tell me there's no five, but George V because it was he was the first George to have um, any letterboxes. He didn't put the number on the on the cipher. But yeah, so that's uh, that was uh, our late late Queen's uh, grandfather. So quite quite an old uh, letterbox. Anyway. So little little Manf Manfred goes off with his mum, and they get um, they go to London Bridge uh, Station, where um, I'm just gonna cross. So they go to London Bridge Station, where a few people actually saw them. The uh, the 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 attendant in the ladies' waiting room, Ellen Rees, she. Um, she claimed that she saw the boy with his mother in the ladies' waiting room. You know, at the time, ladies and men couldn't wait in the same room, of course. Respectable ladies wouldn't do that, so they had a special room. And um, um, Oral, three and a half rows. He was, he was three and a half that day. And um, uh, the, the, the attendant, Ellen, she asked the mum why, uh, why the boy didn't look happy. He looked a bit, uh, a bit grumpy. The mother said, he's missing his nanny and uh, he might feel a bit better if I buy him a cake. So she bought him a cake and, um, and at that point, um, Louisa said she was waiting. So the lady was like, are you going on a train? She said, no, I'm waiting for somebody. And then eventually, 10 minutes later, the, the mother and the little boy left. A few hours later, so that was about 3.30 p.m., London Bridge. So south of the river, 6:20 p.m. at Dalston, St uh, Dalston Junction Station. So around here, uh, two ladies went uh, into the toilets, and they um, they tried to push the door into the, the public toilets at the station when the door was a bit blocked by by something. So the toilets were not very well lit, but she could see something was clearly blocking it. And that thing, that thing was covered by a black shawl. She lifted up the, the she lifted up the, the black shawl, and she could see a boy's face. It was the naked body of a little boy that had been brutally attacked. A brick was left next to the body. So she, of course, uh, told the station staff. They got uh, they got the pathologist on the scene quite soon. At first, the pathologist said the the, the boy had been killed an hour earlier. Uh, then they changed their mind on that. And uh, uh, the police didn't know where to start to, to, get, uh, to get any information about the boy, so they posted, it. They posted um, a description in the newspaper. And on the Monday, uh, Mrs. Gentle, his nanny, was reading the newspaper and they thought, that, that looks like, a, like my little Manfred. So she went to the mortuary, she asked to see the boy, she recognized him, it was indeed Manfred. So she went straight to the police station. She told them that she, had, uh, she, she was, she was uh, minding the boy for the last three years, but she had to hand him back to his mother. And um, the, uh, the police, of course, took it very seriously. They, um, they got the address, 29 Bethan Street, so, so they, this road here, from, uh, from Mrs. Gentle. The police came here in front of number 29 and they, they waited. They didn't see Louisa anywhere, but they saw two gentlemen coming out. It was actually a, a brother-in-law. They followed them to the station. The two men took a, a train ticket to, uh, to Croydon and the police officer went to the, the, the ticket sales uh, assistant and they were like, two tickets for the same place, please. And then they confronted the men uh, uh, about why they were following them. So the men actually explained that, um, let me cross over here because there's a rope, um, that uh, they were on their way to actually see Louisa. She was in Croydon. When they got to Croydon, Louisa was there. She was in tears. She was hiding in, the, in her other sister's um, apartment because she had got back from Brighton where she spent the, the weekend. And she, um, 
she, she had seen the newspaper. Her version of the story was that she, it had been a while that she wanted to... She was not convinced that Manfred was getting the best education with his nanny. And, and uh, she had actually mentioned that to her sister, so that's probably true. And, um, and one, one of those Wednesdays at the park, uh, when she was, uh, she was visiting her son, two ladies approached her. The two ladies had a little girl, and they said they were going to open a new school in, uh, in Chelsea, in, uh, on the King's Road. They gave her an address, the address of the, the, the new school. The two ladies were known as Browning. And um, they said they would be more than happy to take little Manfred, to give him a good education. They would only ask for 12 pounds a year. And, uh, um, sorry. And uh, they, um, the, the, she met the ladies again and eventually she agreed. That's when she wrote to the nanny saying the boy was going in France because she didn't want to, she didn't want to, to get, um, to, 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 to offense the, the nanny, you know, she didn't want to tell her that she wasn't convinced uh, she was giving her the best education, giving him the best education. So she made up the story about going to France just because she did not want to offend the nanny. Um, and that day she got the boy from, uh, from the nanny. They went on to London Bridge where they were meant to meet the two ladies that were going to take the boy away. They were going to take him to, uh, to Chelsea. And, and, um, and uh, Louisa, she was going down to Brighton that day with her new lover, Odor. Um, he was going to join her the next day in Brighton for a weekend, uh, their first weekend together, their first night together, actually, in a hotel down there. So the police, well, the police listened to the story, but for them it was just that, it was just a story. There was no way it could be true. Of course, they um, investigated, but there was no trace of the, the two ladies. She didn't have a receipt, so she had given, given them 12 pounds for the year of education, but she didn't get a receipt because apparently her train was about to arrive, uh, and the ladies went to get some paper. They were taking too long, so that's why she jumped on her train to Brighton. So she was, of course, arrested, and she went down to the Old Bailey when she was judged uh, as, as guilty. To be fair, there were some incriminating uh, evidence. Um, not only there was no, there was no trace of the two ladies, but on top of that, in Brighton Station, um, uh, a few a few uh, uh, a few days later, a package had been found. Uh, the package was wrapped in paper that came from uh, from Mrs. Gentle's home, so that was the package she had given Louisa, with. Um, with some of the, the clothes that he was wearing, the little sailor's hat that he's wearing on the photo. So that, that had been left in Brighton Station. Um, only two items of clothing though, not his full outfit. Why? I don't know. But that was very incriminating because of course she went on to Brighton. So this is the home, number 29 here. So that's the, the dirty looking one. And the, the red one, that's her mum. Her, her mother lived, lived at number 31 with a door. And um, what mum would give a young child over to strangers? Well, her, her excuse is that she was meant to go and visit the school, but she didn't have time, she said. Um, so, yeah, I mean, she probably wasn't the best of mother, but was she a criminal? Uh, personally, I'm not convinced. So she gave, um, she, uh, uh, so they, they they found the items of clothing in Brighton, and on top of that, the nanny had given some of the toys, um, his favorite toys, back, to, uh, back to, to Louisa. In her hotel room in Brighton, they found, so the boy had a little scale, you know, to play like the, to play like the, the trader, you know, weigh, weighing uh, items. That little toy scale was found in Brighton in the hotel room she used. And um, she was hanged. She was actually the first woman to, to be hanged in the 20th century at Newgate Prison. Now, that's quite, that's not, uh, that's not a lot of evidence, you know. And what we do know is that three years later, there were indeed two baby farmers that were, uh, that were caught. And you know that because we mentioned them before. When we went to... Um, when we did a tour in, uh, um, 
where did we go? Angel, I told you about Annie Walters and Amelia Sash. Some of you might remember they were baby farmers, so those ladies were paid by the mothers to take away the illegitimate child. They'll be paid off um, usually a, a, a good sum, and then they were meant to give the babies for adoption, or, or they were meant to, uh, to, um, to, to give them an education. But that trade was terribly regulated, and very sadly, uh, some baby farmers were serial killers. You might know the case of Amelia Dyer, the worst one of them. So those two ladies, I think they would have fit the, the description quite well. They were caught eventually because, um, because uh, 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 Annie Walters, she was not the smartest of criminals. Go home, the, the, the landlord was a police officer. I mean, when you are a criminal and you're killing babies, why do you move in with a police officer? So that's how she got caught, because she used to come home with babies and, and actually once he followed her on and she was sadly disposing of, of one baby into a bin. Um, so yeah, uh, personally I think those two ladies could have been, could have been the two so-called Brownings. Of course they went to Chelsea, they went to the address, but there was no school at all. Um, you might ask me why the, why the, the closing would be found in, uh, in, in Brighton? Well, if the two ladies wanted to frame Louisa, they knew she was on her way to Brighton. They could have taken the, the boy's closing to, um, to, to drop it in Brighton Station because they knew it was going to be found there. Now, there were also two eyewitnesses that were not taken uh, into consideration. They claimed that they had seen one was at the station, one was on a bus on the way back towards Dalston, two ladies Mm. Well, there was all, another eyewitness that was quite damning for, um, for, for Louisa. Um, uh, Ellen Rees, the lady that had seen Louisa with the boy at three at the station. Uh, Louisa claimed that she took the four o'clock train to Brighton. When that, uh, that staff, that attendant in the ladies waiting room, she said she saw Louisa again at 6, um, 6.20. So she would have then taken the, the, 7, uh, the 720 uh, uh, train to Brighton. So she would have had plenty of time to go back up to Dalston, a station she knew very well, kill her little boy in the toilets, and, uh, uh, and then go back to take her train. We will never know. Um, there was also the brick. The brick was matching the bricks that were taken from here at uh, 29 uh, Bethune Road. So the brick was identified as coming from her garden, really. And um, the, uh, uh, you know, but if they wanted to frame her, they could have grabbed the brick as well. On the baby's, on the, on the base, baby's body, there was a black shawl. The black shawl was identified as being bought from here in Stoke Newington somewhere. And the lady at the shop, they said, yes, it could be Louisa. But to be completely honest, uh, she didn't identify her. Even the second, uh, the eyewitness from the station, when she, um, when she recognized Louisa on an identity parade, Louisa's face had already been all over the newspapers. So we know that eyewitnesses should only be trusted to an extent and not, uh, not that much. So yeah, very sad story. And it is double sad if indeed, um, if indeed uh, um, Louisa was not guilty, we will never know. Personally, I don't think she was. She, pro she was probably a bad mother, but not a killer. Anyway, one little story while we're here, Fairholt Road, um, at number 46, there was another, uh, we're not gonna go all the way because it's a bit further, there was another terrible murder a year later. In 1900, there was um, a gentleman that lived here, 61 years old. He, um, he was coming into financial uh, hard times. He, uh, he, he, could, he could only afford to have one servant at that point. Imagine only one servant. And he, um, he, he, one day, he sent a letter to his friends, a letter that looked a little bit suspicious. He told them to, uh, to take care of number 46 and to take care of the three cats. So of course the, um, the, uh, 
uh, the, the friends to, thought it was very suspicious, so they run to the home and he had brutally killed his wife and himself. He had uh, drowned himself in the bath after, after killing his wife. So another very sad story that was just a year after, uh, after Manfred, completely unrelated, but, um, but yeah. Yeah, it's still raining hard, but that's okay. It's gonna be the end of the tour. So I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna have to cycle in the rain, but I'm gonna go and warm up some, somewhere at home. Anyway, let me show you my face again. Oh. And uh, thank you very much for coming today. Let me know in the chat if you have any, uh, any questions before we go. If not, uh, thank you for coming. Sorry about the rain. And, um, and uh, if you want to see a bit more of me, on Sunday, we're heading back to Charing Cross. So we'll have some dark stories there as well. Linda, well, you know what? At least he, he didn't kill the cats. Because um, some, some killers do. You might remember the tour I did of Xavier Dupont de Ligonnès, a killer in Nantes that killed all his family because he was, probably because he was falling on hard financial times, times as well. I, he had killed his dogs, so at least this one uh, spared the, the, the stray cats. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Ronnie. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Pissas. Thanks, uh, Emma number two. Uh, thanks to have you here. And um, hopefully I'll see you on, on Sunday in Charing Cross. If not, Tuesday, we're heading to Surrey. We're heading to Goldeming, where we'll have, um, where we'll have uh, a couple of uh, Victorian murders as well. And if any of you drop me a little tip on, on PayPal or on buy me a coffee or anything, um, I don't see them live, but please know that you're very, very much uh, appreciated. It is really thanks to uh, your generosity that, uh, that I can keep going and, uh, and doing more tours. What kind of trees are those? Um, I don't know. You know what? I don't, I don't actually know. I, I have an app to scan the trees, uh, and uh, the app tells me, but I cannot do it now because uh, I'm, on, uh, I'm on a different app. It probably wouldn't work in the dark. I think it needs a bit more light anyway. Cool. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I'll see you on Sunday, hopefully. Have a good evening, a good morning, whatever time it is for you, wherever you are in the world. And, uh, and uh, keep YouTubing. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>